On to oral questions put by members to ministers. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Looking back on this session, the Premier used the words, and I quote, credit rating, to answer multiple questions, mostly about his government's privacy failures. Meanwhile, he quietly ignored another measure of fiscal health, though the Parliamentary Budget Officer's 2018 Fiscal Sustainability Report indicated that this province is not on a fiscally sustainable path. This government has the province on track to more than triple its net debt relative to the GDP over the next 50 years, Mr. Speaker, and I'll table that. So my question is, why did the Premier fail to highlight the PBO's dismal update on Nova Scotia's fiscal sustainability? The Honourable Premier. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. It gives me an opportunity to continue to talk about the great work uh, the Minister of Finance and, uh, Mr. Speaker, this entire government has been doing. Uh, to dig our province out of the fiscal mess it has been uh, in, Mr. Speaker. Uh, credit rating is at an all-time high, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the debt-to-GDP ratio is actually declining, Mr. Speaker. Under successive governments, it was going in the wrong direction, Mr. Speaker. We are on track by 2024 to hit near our, 20, our 30 percent, which was the gold in the Ivory Report, Mr. Speaker. When we came in, it was at 38 percent. Mr. Speaker, it required tough decisions. It required political courage and leadership, Mr. Speaker, something this province had been lacking for a very long time. And I'm very proud to say, Mr. Speaker, when I look across the Federation, under successive governments of all political stripes, they could take a lesson from this government, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, that might be a little rich, but this government took every opportunity to discuss last year's PBO report. One minister used it as proof that the Liberals were not, and I quote, burdening our children with more debt and interest payments, and I'll table that. Another used it to justify investments that, I will quote, will be affordable tomorrow, and I'll table that. This government congratulated itself, and I quote, living within our means, and now, just a year later, the PBO states that Nova Scotia has fiscal policies that are not sustainable over the long term, and that was just tabled as well. So, if last year's PBO report indicated we are, quote, living within our means, does this year's report confirm that this government is spending beyond its means? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, one of the things clearly indicates, Mr. Speaker, that we've uh, delivered our third consecutive balanced budget, Mr. Speaker. We continue to look over the horizon, Mr. Speaker. And we see continued balanced budgets in the future of this province, continuing to ensure, though, that we make investments in important infrastructure. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as you'll know, the announcement we made around the $2 billion investment in the QE2, uh, Mr. Speaker, that's an important piece of physical infrastructure that we continue to make those investments at the same time. We're continuing to drive down our jet, debt to GDP ratio, Mr. Speaker, to come out, Mr. Speaker, one of the lowest in the country when it comes to that, Mr. Speaker. We're continuing to make good fiscal policy where we're seeing young people choosing to live in this province, Mr. Speaker, bucking a tre trend not only in this province, Mr. Speaker, other provinces when the youth were leaving, Mr. Speaker, this province has seen an in-migration of young people over the last two years. We've seen our population hit an all-time high, Mr. Speaker. On every indication, this province is moving in the right direction, Mr. Speaker. And let me be very clear about it. As long as we get the privilege to be in this seat, Mr. Speaker, we'll operate with the political courage required to continue to move this economy forward. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Look, Mr. Speaker, hundreds, hundreds of millions of dollars appear from an offshore settlement, but details are scarce. Government hires uh, consultants to write reports on hospital infrastructure, but the Premier can't release it without completely redacting the document. And I can actually table that quote. The Premier repeatedly ignores his own campaign promise to empower the Privacy Commissioner. And now, an independent fiscal sustainability report directly contradicts this government's own press releases about fiscal management. So, can the Premier tell us, please, did the PBO get it all wrong? Or is this government obsessed with only telling Nova Scotians the truth when it suits their narrative? The Honourable Premier. Speaker I, appreciate, uh, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the opportunity to stand. I want to give the Honourable Member a bit of political uh, history, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this party across the aisle is the official opposition, Mr. Order, Speaker. Please. The Honourable Premier has the floor. To talk about, Mr. Speaker, balanced budgets when they were in power, Mr. Speaker. Let's be very clear about something, Mr. Speaker. The Ottawa government in those days, the Prime Minister Cretien and Paul Martin, 
provided an extra $5 billion to this province, Mr. Speaker, to deal with wait time, deal with physical infrastructure. What happened, Mr. Speaker? They continue to blow it in, in operating property. Pro what happened, Mr. Speaker, under our leadership, Mr. Speaker, we made difficult decisions. We challenged the status quo at every step, and they bucked it, Mr. Speaker. Under their leadership, Mr. Speaker, this province would be in a fiscal mess. Under our leadership, Mr. Speaker, we continue to see a bright future behind their horizon, Mr. Speaker, and so do many Nova Scotians. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. S Mr. Speaker, the, the Premier's response to my colleague reminds me of the, the preacher whose sermon had the note on the side, this part's weak, holler loud. Um, so, so, the, so, so the end of a session, the end of a session does in fact provide us with a, a moment to assess the quality of the work in addressing the needs of the, the people of the province that the government is doing. I'd like to approach this simply from the point of view of some uh, basic uh, financial fundamental facts of people's ordinary lives. Does the Premier acknowledge the fact that Nova Scotia today has the highest level of people of low income of any province in the country, and that this number has increased, in fact, over the five years in which this government has been in office. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank Alman for the question. Mr. Speaker, he would know he voted against, Mr. Speaker, the largest uh, tax cut in the history of this province that was directly towards the exact people he's referring to, low-income Nova Scotians. Mr. Speaker, we've seen an important change. We continue to raise the minimum wage, Mr. Speaker, following the pattern and program that was set by the Democratic Party, Mr. Speaker. We've invested, Mr. Speaker, and pre-primary so that every four-year-old, regardless of the socioeconomic circumstances they're born into, will be giving the same start going forward. That, Mr. Speaker, is something that party voted against, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, that will allow, Mr. Speaker, our parents across this province to get back into the workforce a year earlier to continue to make sure they provide for their families, give them, Mr. Speaker, hope, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, that party continues to vote against everything that is moving this province forward and continues to be stuck in the past. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, this matter is far too important to allow it to be swept aside with this kind of vituperation and evasion. Uh, the fact of the matter is that in, here in Nova Scotia, Feed Nova Scotia is regularly speaking about how we have the highest number of the highest percentage of people anywhere in the country who report themselves as not being able to get enough to eat because they can't afford it. Uh, so I want to ask the Premier if he acknowledges simply that this in fact is a fact or does he think that the New Democratic Party and Feed Nova Scotia are making these numbers up? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, again, I want to remind the Honourable Member, Mr. Speaker, he voted against the largest single tax cut that provided more money in the pockets of the very people he's talking about, Mr. Speaker. He voted against taking 60,000 people off the tax roll, Mr. Speaker. That's the record of the Democratic Party, Mr. Speaker. When they were in power, what did they do for low-income Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker? We're transformation when it comes to income assistance, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to make sure that when we had the fiscal capacity, Mr. Speaker, in this province, we are directing it towards those who need our help the most. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, they continue when they're in power to give a seven and a half percent pay raise to those Nova Scotians who are doing the best off, Mr. Speaker, and ignored, Mr. Speaker, low-income Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker. We struck a balance, Mr. Speaker, one that gives all Nova Scotians a hope, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Mr. Speaker, this is far too important a matter for me to take the time of the House to debate uh, about a matter of history, something that happened six, seven, eight years ago. I want to begin with the day the Premier was elected, because on that day, the most poorly paid people in Nova Scotia received the fourth highest minimum wage in Canada. But today, the most poorly paid people in our province receive the lowest minimum wage in the country. Everybody who looks at this subject understands that when the minimum wage goes up, 
food bank use goes down. We see this most recently in Ontario and here in our province at this moment we've got the fastest rising food bank use in the country. So I want to ask, is it any wonder I want to ask the Premier that we have got today the second worst projected GDP growth in the country when there's so many people of our, country, of our province who can't even buy their food. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I appreciate the Honourable Member going back uh, to October of 2013 when we were elected, Mr. Speaker. We had a half a billion dollar hole, Mr. Speaker, that the Honourable Member's party put us in. Mr. Speaker, where did they spend that money, Mr. Speaker? The very people he's talking about, Mr. Speaker, weren't order, mentioned on order, please. The Honourable Premier has the floor. He's talking about, Mr. Speaker, weren't mentioned in any of their budgets, Mr. Speaker. The largest increase in income assistance happened under this government, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, we were trying to control the cost of delivering services in Nova Scotians. What they did, Mr. Speaker, is saddle up to their union leaders, Mr. Speaker, and fight on behalf of and continuing to drive, Mr. Speaker, escalate labour costs through the roof when they are leaving behind so many Nova Scotians. I want to remind the Honourable Member, we took 60,000 people off the tax roll, low-income Nova Scotians. We gave the largest single tax cut to low-income Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, young people see a future for themselves, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you for the standing ovation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for uh, the Minister responsible for NSLC. This week we learned that Nova Scotians will need a special access code if they want to purchase recreational cannabis online. The sudden announcement, eight days before legalization, caused many to wonder about this government's readiness for cannabis. Indeed, the NSLC has been quietly modifying its website in recent months and days. References to online sales have been removed from the frequently asked question page along with references to direct delivery and ID verification at the door and I can table those facts. It appears that this government is hiding details for cannabis retail until the very last minute. It certainly feels that way. So my question is for the minister responsible for NSLC, what other surprises are in store for Nova Scotians attempting to purchase legal cannabis online? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. I think everyone is anxiously watching the October 17th date. We as a government made a policy decision that NSLC would be given the responsibility for the retail of cannabis in Nova Scotia. We know that they've worked diligently. They have their, certainly their mandate of social responsibility, and they will make sure that they protect youth, which is our goal, youth and uh, the safety distribution through the retail market for cannabis. And Mr. Speaker, we know that there there are other places across the province, across the nation, who are relying on an honor system, Mr. Speaker. That's not good enough for us. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Nova Scotians. Uh, are not satisfied that the legalized uh, cannabis will not. Uh, they're worried, basically, that it's going to fall into the hands of children. And in the past week, instead of being clear and upfront with Nova Scotians, word of NSLC supply shortages and access codes leaked in the media. The following words were scrubbed from the NSLC website, and I quote, the delivery agent will require valid identification at the door to confirm the recipient is eligible to purchase the product, end of quote. Meanwhile, the NSLC, and I quote, asks that customers don't transfer, end of quote, access code car cards for the website, and I'll table that. I'm sure if they ask nicely, access codes and cannabis won't end up in the hands of the unintended. So can the minister explain how the NSLC's vague and uncertain plans for online, online cannabis delivery are supposed to protect our children? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and the intent of the age verification process and the barcode that my colleague refers to is quite factual, Mr. Speaker, to do just that. It provides protection on the front end so our youth can't access the website. Nova Scotians will have to go to a Nova Scotia Liquor Corporation retail site to obtain a barcode. Mr. Speaker, uh, 
we as government, you and I as individuals, cannot control what they do with that. We hope and they understand that the education and awareness around the consumption of cannabis, Mr. Speaker, is a, is a decision that we will all make. Mr. Speaker, the, the back end of that, Mr. Speaker, and the delivery of that product has to be provided, not delivered or left with anyone not of legal age. We believe, Mr. Speaker, we have captured and addressed those safety measures on the front end of the online program, and we've captured those safety measures on the back end. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Education. When the Minister eliminated democratically elected school boards in March, he offered up an expanded role for school advisory councils as reassurance. Parents, teachers, students and administrators who make up SACs have been meeting, but they still have no clarity about what this expanded role is. They haven't received an updated handbook, they haven't received guidance on how their new bylaws or terms of reference should align with the new administrative structure for education. We are now six months into this process and it still seems like the minister is making it up as he goes along. Mr. Speaker, when will the minister provide SACs with clarity around their new rules? The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We've already provided uh, the regions with the new framework for SAC involvement, which includes an increase in their budgets, uh, which they can uh, spend $5,000 plus a, a dollar for every head. Uh, a student that's in their school on areas that relate to student well-being and achievement. Uh, we're expanding their involvement from a policy perspective. We're going to be engaging them uh, in a busing conversation. We're engaging them in extracurricular uh, volunteer conversation as well. Those are the first two policy priorities that we're engaging them with. Uh, my expectation was that these, this information would have been delivered to SACs. I know uh, a lot of SACs don't meet until the end of September or beginning of October, so perhaps there's some that are just mean and haven't received that information, but we'll make sure that they get it uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Speaker, the Minister legislated away school boards in March. School started in September. It's now October, and the Provincial Advisory Council on Education hasn't met, and school advisory councils, whether or not they should, have no idea what they're supposed to be doing. None of this is reassuring for parents, teachers, or students. This summer, the minister said in a release that SACs would have access to new funds to support their works, and he said it again in this house. But here, too, we have more questions than answers. Parents are wondering if these are actually new funds or just a new name for the student support grants that schools already had access to. Mr. Speaker, will the minister confirm that the funds being provided to SACs are, in fact, new money? The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We did work to expedite the... Um, uh, um, appointment of the of the Provincial Advisory Council on Education. I'll remind the member that her and the Conservatives did delay that process by a few days. We are working with them right now to get them together as quickly. Order, please. The Honourable Minister of Education has the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We're working with them right now to find a date where they can all meet uh, together uh, for the first time. The uh, fo the high quality people that we have on that group are really excited to begin their work. Uh, and I will uh, I will inform the member that the new dollar that are going into the SACs are actually savings that we did find in uh, order, please. the Honourable Member for Truro, Millbrook, Bible Hill, Salmon River will come to order. The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you kindly, Mr. Speaker. The uh, dollars used are from the savings that we did find in, in reorganizing the governance structure of the education system, one that was contributing to low achievement levels and a, dispar and a disproportion in, in achievement levels from one region to the next. And those are new dollars going to our school communities that are above and beyond the, uh, sco the, uh, the, the grants that the member spoke of. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the uh, Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, the Minister responsible for the Workers' Compensation Board said in a previous answer that if there is an individual who can't perform their job duties and it is a result of a workplace accident, the Workers' Compensation Board is there to support them in their time of need. That's what this WCB is there for. It is to support our injured workers when they can't work in terms of insurance and covering their earnings. I couldn't agree more with the Minister's comments. However, Mr. Speaker, this often doesn't happen, and sadly the reality of many cases that come to my office is that they've been strong-armed by WCB. My question to the Minister, would he agree that the WCB is not always there for the injured worker? The Honourable Minister of Labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the WCB is there for the injured worker, and in cases that an injured worker feels that they are not uh, having their needs met by WCB, there's an appeal process. 
In Pictou County alone, there is actually uh, an advocacy group that works on behalf of workers, and that is also funded by our department. And Mr. Speaker, if the member has any uh, individuals that feel that they are not getting the proper coverage from Workers' Compensation Board, I can provide the information to the member of the Picto Advocacy Group and they can help the, the constituents out. Thank the you. The Honourable Member for Picto Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, time doesn't permit for all the things I would like to say about that answer. <laughs> However, Mr. Speaker, Daryl McKinnon, a constituent of mine from Pictou County, slipped and fell at his place of employment, injuring himself on February 13, 2013. Mr. McKinnon has been examined by several neurologists in this province who have rendered very convincing reports in his favour. However, it appears to me that it is very obvious the goal of the WCB is to reject these findings by sending patients for an independent medical examination of WCB's choosing with a follow-up letter to the workers stating that they have been denied and they need to bring forth new evidence to appeal. My question to the Minister, how can he sit and watch while WCB continues to deny legitimate claims and force injured workers to face a bureaucratic nightmare that often never gets resolved? The Honourable Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned earlier, there is a process, and if an injured worker feels that they are not getting the coverage that they deserve from Workers' Compensation Board, there's an appeal process. There are also advocacy groups that they can go and engage with, and that advocacy group will help them navigate through uh, the appeal process. And there's one actually in Picto, and I'm more than happy to share the information with the member. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. I've received calls from a number of constituents regarding the shift of lab services from Roseway Hospital to the Yarmouth Regional Hospital for processing. If the Minister would have taken me up on my kind invitation to attend last month's health care rally, he would have heard firsthand the implications this decision has had on the care that patients are receiving. Once again, this government reverts to the same old talking point that staff shortages were the reason for the change in services. Well, Mr. Speaker, forgive me for being skeptical, but the last time we heard this political spin, we soon found out that the hospitals in Northside and New Waterford were on the chopping block. My question to the Minister is, could he please provide an update on how many technicians have been recruited and when will lab services be completely restored back to the Roseway Hospital? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank the member for the question. Uh, with respect to uh, the recruitment of healthcare professionals across uh, the healthcare system, Mr. Speaker, uh, those efforts are ongoing throughout uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority and the IWK. Uh, to the member's specific question about lab technicians at that uh, site, I don't have that information uh, on hand, but certainly uh, we'll uh, follow up with the member uh, with uh, any information uh, update with respect to uh, posted positions and recruitment uh, for that site. The Honourable Member for Queen Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have stood in this chamber countless times sharing the concerns of my constituents about Roseway Hospital. In classic fashion, the Minister has referred to the Collaborative Care Centre over and over as the grand solution to many problems facing the people of Shelburne. When the Minister was asked about lab services at Roseway in the past, he said the doors would open this fall. Mr. Speaker, the leaves have turned and the pumpkins are out. My constituents want their lab services back, and so do I. I'm concerned more than ever that Roseway is on the chopping block after I recently read a flyer sent out by NSHA stating that lab services and diagnostic imaging will be accessible at the new collaborative care centre when it opens, and I'll table that document. My question to the Minister is, does the Minister intend to close the Ros Roseway Hospital once this collaborative care centre opens? The people of Shelburne deserve to know. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the member uh, suggested that uh, the uh, references to the primary health care uh, clinic uh, in our community uh, that is uh, well underway uh, and near uh, completion. 
uh, has been presented as a grand solution. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, that is not uh, what I'd indicated. Uh, in fact, it is one part of, of work that's ongoing, Mr. Speaker, uh, to provide infrastructure that supports the community. Other initiatives the member would be well aware of that we have uh, invested in include increasing the compensation for physicians, uh, almost $40 million, Mr. Speaker, that we committed in partnership with Doctors Nova Scotia based upon uh, their requests and, and feedback. Mr. Speaker, uh, we continue continue to uh, expand uh, access uh, in uh, residency programs, in uh, nurse practitioner training programs, Mr. Speaker. We change our incentive programs, uh, immigration stream, number of steps, Mr. Speaker, that we're taking for improving health care recruitment across the province. Honourable Member for Picto East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Dialysis patients in Pictou County continue to suffer from a lack of chairs in the area. The last budget included new dialysis units for Bridgewater. Kenful, Digby, Glace Bay, but not for Pictou. My colleagues from Pictou West and Pictou Centre have raised this issue numerous times. There's a resident in Pictou East who needs dialysis, but needs to travel to Antigonish or Truro for the treatment. This individual cannot afford the travel, plain and simple, Mr. Speaker. We've managed to find another dialysis patient on the same schedule who can drive her but that is not a sustainable solution. My question for the Minister is, what does the Minister say to people who can't afford to travel but need to get the treatment? The Honourable Minister of Health. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, indeed, uh, the member has uh, referenced a number of the sites that uh, uh, the last uh, review of our renal uh, program for di renal dialysis uh, identified. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that review looked uh, in large part as to uh, demands and travel times. Uh, he'll note a number of the sites uh, that he indicated are new sites that reduces the travel time significantly in those parts of the uh, province. I believe it's uh, over 40 additional seats that were added adding to our provincial uh, system for dialysis treatment. Uh, this is improving uh, for all Nova Scotians. Uh, with respect to uh, individuals, Mr. Speaker, one of the first things I encourage individuals to consider, whether they have a, a treatment centre uh, and seats available nearby, uh, is to uh, look at the opportunities for home dialysis, Mr. Speaker. It's a great opportunity for many Nova Scotians, uh, although I do recognise it doesn't work for everybody. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister's right. Home dialysis is a great option for those that can do it, but it's not for everyone. And if the Minister thinks that home care should be administered by carpool, we have big problems. We have big problems. I don't need to tell the Minister what can happen uh, when a dialysis patient misses a treatment. An ounce of prevention really is worth a pound of cure, Mr. Speaker. And we've seen time and time again how this government makes decisions that result in costly hospital stays because the system isn't nimble enough to make more co cost-effective, common-sense choices. Mr. Speaker, my question for the Minister is, will he commit to the people of Pictou County that have opened up some additional chairs in the area, if not now, then at least in the spring budget? Thank you, Mr. The Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as uh, I've explained uh, to uh, my colleagues here in the legislature, uh, indeed uh, the member's own colleague uh, from uh, uh, Barrington uh, raised this question for his community, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as I've noted uh, in the past, uh, we've made uh, significant investments uh, based upon a review of the renal dialysis uh, programs. It's resulted in recommendations uh, and uh, I believe over 40 additional seats being uh, added to our provincial uh, system of uh, renal dialysis. We need to get those uh, across the board, Mr. Speaker, get the designs and those uh, renovations completed, get them up and running, and then uh, reevaluate uh, how those changes uh, impact uh, the availability of treatment uh, for all Nova Scotians, uh, and consider again at that time as we continue to work towards improving our renal dialysis access for all Nova Scotians. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Business. We now know that in 2017, Canada became the top filming location in the world, but Nova Scotia hasn't benefited from that. In fact, we've had the opposite story. That's a re direct result of this government's decision to replace the employment-based film tax credit with an equally expensive but much less effective incentive program. The Minister has indicated he is willing to try and help dig the industry out of the hole his government has put us in. Uh, there is one important important change that the industry says can help make our incentive program competitive again, and that is increasing the base incentive rate. So my question for the Minister is, when can we expect to see the base rate for our incentive program increased? The Honourable Minister of Business. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the member for the question. Uh, based on uh, our conversations uh, with many members of the industry, uh, I haven't uh, certainly heard that what's happening now is much less effective, uh, and I certainly uh, I haven't heard that uh, that the that the industry is is falling apart the way that the member would suggest it is. Um, obviously, uh, we are making those investments. Uh, it, it seems to be that the film and, and screen Nova Scotia and those in the, in the film industry and the production industry uh, are uh, working hard to make sure that Nova Scotia is uh, very very much relevant uh, in the Canadian uh, film and screen market. I think they're doing a great job. We are working on a number of the of the of the options to to put on the table. And Mr. Speaker, uh, as we get into the budget season, I'll certainly talk to Mike Volpe and Screen Nova Scotia to look at what comes next for the film industry. Thanks. The honourable member for Dartmouth North. With respect, I hope the minister does consult with uh, people other than Screen Nova Scotia. Uh, there is a lot of people who have moved out of this province because they cannot work any longer in the film industry here. Well, Nova Scotia's film job numbers have dropped in the last three years, Northern Ontario is experiencing a film job boom. It's not because that region can offer more beautiful sc scenery than Nova Scotia or has a more established talent or infrastructure. It's because they have an incentive program that works and Nova Scotia doesn't anymore. Film and TV networks are making permanent investments in Ontario. CBS has just announced a new studio that will have six sound stages. Nova Scotia doesn't have, any, uh, have a one. Mr. Speaker, industry has been clear that a Downstage is part of what it needs to recover from the damage done by this government. So will the minister tell us when we can expect to see a soundstage in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Business. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, uh, by way of the access, by way of the investment, investment in, in, in our fund for film and screen Nova Scotia, um, we're not seeing that there's some kind of devastation in the industry, Mr. Speaker. It, to me, it's, it's very much vibrant. Well, Mr. Speaker, obviously, it's, it's an easy, easy talking point to say that we've destroyed the industry. The numbers show very much the contrary, Mr. Speaker. We, Order, we have, please. We have, the Honourable Minister of Business has the floor. Mr. Speaker, despite what happens in the conversations around screen here in, in this chamber, we have a very positive relationship with Screen Nova Scotia and the Order, industry. Order, please. The Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River, will excuse herself for the balance of question period. The Honourable Minister of Business. Order, please. First film ever here. Order, please. First one ever. The Honourable Minister of Business. Despite, Mr. Speaker, the antics that we see sometimes uh, with respect to film and screen, they are, we are talking about infrastructure. We are talking about the investments. We are talking about... Uh, what we can do outside of the incentive fund to build and help grow that industry as they're doing on their own as, as their own participants in this industry. They're doing a fantastic job, Mr. Speaker. We're going to be there to help them. Thanks. The Honourable Member for Inverness. For the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Mr. Speaker, um, municipal infrastructure like water and sewer and provincial infrastructure like roads constructed above water and sewer infrastructure are basic critical needs of any community. I think about the community of Inverness. Water and sewer infrastructure is old and constantly breaking and leaking. As a result, the streets of Inverness are a mess. Are there not funds the municipality of Inverness could apply for to fix these issues? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. Uh, yes, there certainly are through the uh, Investing in Canada Infrastructure Fund. We would be happy to uh, sit down with the our staff sit down with the council up there and uh, let them know what's available for them to apply for. I know in recent years, Mr. Speaker, uh, Inverness has had a couple of million dollars worth of gas tax money over the last three years to invest in those kinds of things as well. Uh, clean water and wastewater fund was about uh, oh, just over three quarters of a million dollars in 2016, Mr. Speaker, as well, that came from the province for those kinds of investments. But we would be happy to sit down and uh, talk about the new programs that are coming about and uh, We'll do that as uh, soon as possible. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Minister for that positive response. When I, campaigned, when I campaigned in Inverness, one of the main issues raised was the water. It is rusting out water heater elements, it's discolouring clothing, some find the taste is poor. I have asked many who specialize in water systems, and one of them indicated that the problems may be due to the new water supply flowing through old pipes that may have chemical deposits from the old water supply. Bad water, bad pipes, and streets dug up, ruining pavement. Mr. Speaker, to the Minister. Are there officials in the Minister's Department who can help, and could they reach out to ensure the municipality of Inverness has the support they need to make these sorely needed improvements? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. 
thank you, Mr. Speaker, again. Yes, says the Honourable Member of Crossway. Certainly, uh, we've had uh, advisors and staff uh, visit the Inverness as well as other municipalities around the province. Mr. Speaker, we would be happy to once again uh, visit Inverness and offer whatever assistance, as I said, uh, around those kinds of decisions and programs, Mr. Speaker. And um, all they need to do is reach out. Perhaps we'll reach out to them on a on a uh, positive note, Mr. Speaker, I'll uh, speak to uh, our staff this afternoon and uh, have them make contact with the new CAO that I believe now is in, uh, in Inverness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage. I figured he needed what he has been asked any this session. Mr. Speaker, as fall has arrived and the leaves are changing colour, Thousands of tourists will travel to Cape Breton for Celtic colours and to experience the beauty of our beloved Cabot Trail in central Cape Breton. These are just two of the many tourist attractions that our province can offer to those that travel here from around the globe. As such, we need to support community groups, such as the Nova Scotia Highland Village, who come together and produce important projects that add to the wonderful tourist experience Nova Scotia offers those who choose to travel here. Mr. Speaker, my question for the Minister, how many project is, projects has his department approved through the tangible capital asset process? The Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member uh, for the question. In fact, I'm pleased to get any question. Uh, uh, but uh, but no, the, he asks a very, very important question. I visited the Highland Village uh, during the summer, and, uh, and it is uh, an exceptional uh, uh, site to, to continue to cultivate the uh, Scottish uh, uh, heritage uh, in our province. Uh, in terms of uh, how many uh, projects, uh, I, don't, I don't have the... Uh, the exact number. I can get that for him. But what I can tell the member today uh, is that uh, we are certainly prepared and committed to support this uh, uh, project as soon as the uh, capital, tangible capital asset uh, process uh, is complete. The Honourable <laughs> Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that answer. Mr. Speaker, for the past two years, Nova Scotia Highland Village Society have submitted their proposal for funding to address important infrastructure upgrades and improvements to the Highland Village. As a living history museum and culture centre that celebrates the stories and experiences of our province's gales, the Highland Village plays a valuable role in the Nova Scotia Museum system. I've written to the Minister's office, and I'll table that letter, Mr. Mr. Speaker, and rise today to highlight that this group has been approved by ACOA and other funding partners, but to date have not received approval from the province for this very worthwhile project. Back in May, this group was told they would get an answer by the end of the summer after a tangible capital asset process was complete. Mr. Speaker, the group still has not received an answer. So my question to the minister is, will he please commit to when this worthwhile project will be approved so work can begin to start on the Highland Village. The Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, what I can convey to the member uh, uh, today is that uh, our department have been working with uh, senior staff and the board at, uh, at Highland uh, Village. Uh, and I know that uh, that uh, work is uh, uh, is getting very close uh, to completion. It is uh, it is ongoing, uh, and as I said, we are committed uh, uh, to supporting this uh, project because it does need a visitor service uh, upgrade. It needs uh, a, a better area for storage of uh, art artifacts, uh, administrative uh, work, and it has a great. Uh, learning center uh, within uh, within the uh, facility there, but again, it does need an upgrade, and uh, I'm sure we'll have something very shortly uh, that is very tangible for the member. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question through you, or to you is uh, to the Minister of Transportation Infrastructure Renewal. Whether you believe in aliens or not, Something crashed off Shag Harbor 51 years ago. <laughs> there are still many eyewitnesses, and the whole area watched as our Navy and Air Force scoured the area for days trying to recover whatever crashed in the ocean. The report that was filed was the first government document that refers to an unidentified flying object. And quite honestly, this incident, according to experts, is bigger than Roswell, New Mexico, and receives millions of tourists per year, 
But as you drive down the 103, there are no signs pointing you to Shag Harbour. It's a great community with a unique story to tell. My question to the minister is, why are there no highway signs on the 103 to identify this important community? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member opposite uh, for the excellent question. Uh, I'm very familiar with the, uh, the, the question of uh, uh, Shag Har Harbour being a UFO <coughs> uh, buff myself, which is a handy occupation to have in this chamber, sir. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's a very good question that we would be happy to work with the local municipality to see if we can uh, come up with a solution to that and help that tourism opportunity. Thank you. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. So, Mr. Speaker, you know, if you drive around the province, you'll notice something on all our highway signs. Li they list three communities. In fact, the policy is that signs can have, to ha can have up to three communities on them. But as you drive along the 103, where you need to turn off for Shag Harbour, there are only two community signs. And I can tell you, Shag Harbour is not one of them. Coincidence? Maybe. The department says that it's because the community population isn't large enough, but Mr. Speaker, that's only counting earthlings. <laughs> the community is only trying to promote itself and draw a few tourists. Will the minister tell the people that what is this government hiding in Shag Harbour? <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member for the question. Uh, in, in, on a serious note, though, two serious notes. First of all, uh, the, uh, with, the, with the hopeful passage of the Traffic Safety Act <clears throat> shortly, uh, the whole signage issue enters a new realm in Nova Scotia, and we, we do intend to spend some time looking at uh, our past practices and so on uh, with regard to that uh, uh, particular area. The thing I do want to take the opportunity to do, Mr. Speaker, is to ask all the members of the House in the next while to become safety ambassadors with all the folks in my department and to remind all their constituents that we are entering snow tire season and to make sure that you get your car winterized and to put your snow tires on. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister responsible for the Workers' Compensation Board. Uh, after several years of advocating for change, uh, I was glad last year to rise in the House to support, uh, in support of a bill uh, that would provide presumptive coverage of WC benefits for first responders, paramedics, correctional officers, emergency response dispatchers, firefighters, nurse, police officers and others who are diagnosed with work-related post-traumatic stress disorder here in Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, will the minister confirm uh, that these changes will come into effect by the end of October 2018, as promised when the bill passed third reading a year ago? The Honourable Minister of Labour. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's my pleasure to confirm that on October 26 of this year, the changes for presumptive coverage will take effect for Workers' Compensation Board. The Honourable House Leader for the official New Democratic Party. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that answer. My uh, next question will be to the Premier. I don't think it's possible in these uh, lines of work uh, to mentally prepare yourself for the things you may have to see, Mr. Speaker, and it may take years to fully understand the toll it takes or recognize the symptoms and seek treatment uh, or diagnosis Many first responders continue to suffer the effects of PTSD. Uh, some have decided uh, the suffering was too much. I don't uh, want to attend another funeral of a first responder, Mr. Speaker, like I did this spring. So I'd like to ask the Premier, will the Premier provide assurances uh, for those who are currently in limbo waiting for the WCB, deci uh, WCB decision and the many others who have been denied coverage in the past, the ability to have their case reviewed under the new policy for presumptive coverage of WC benefits for first responders. The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, thank the Honourable for the question. I know, uh, Mr. Speaker, he and the member from uh, uh, Hans West and other members of this House who have volunteered in their communities, uh, Mr. Speaker, volunteer firefighters uh, who have seen, uh, Mr. Speaker, things that uh, many of us have no capacity to kind of understand the impact it would have because we haven't been there. Uh, his uh, the passion and commitment to, to this has been 
uh, I think, a true example of what it is to be a legislator in this House through successive governments. He continued to ensure in his own humble uh, way that those in our communities who are first responders who have been suffering uh, with uh, uh, PTSD uh, finally been heard. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to tell the honourable member uh, uh, the regulations in and around that bill, as uh, the uh, minister said, will be in place at the end of this month. And I will take the question that he brought to me to, to that department uh, to ensure that those uh, who are also suffering will not be denied because of a cutoff date or time, that those cases will be looked at in a way uh, that is compassionate uh, and uh, caring uh, for those individuals. The Honourable Member for Bull Harbour, Portland Valley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Everyone's fear in Nova Scotia is that something serious will get missed when it comes to their health care they get in the emergency department. Recently, the sister of a constituent of mine, Beverly Ann Hodder, whose family are here today, fell while walking her dog. She is on the autism spectrum and was unable to communicate with those treating her. She was prescribed pills in the ER for pain and sent home. She went back the next day because she was in pain and was sent home on a stretcher. She came back the third day, had some tests they were told were normal, but she was admitted to hospital. It was only nine days later when she lost the ability to walk that they realized that they had missed three levels of a spinal fracture and she's now paralyzed from the waist down. Speaking broadly to the situation, can the Minister of Health tell me and the process that the uh, hospitals are using to deal with patients who present as nonverbal at emergency departments? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, certainly uh, the uh, frontline health care professionals uh, that we rely on throughout our health care system, including in emergency departments, uh, have uh, extensive levels of training to uh, assess and provide uh, the health care for Nova Scotians. Uh, with, uh, with respect to, um, I know with uh, respect to um, uh, language translations, uh, which I believe also includes um, nonverbal for sign language anyway. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, not to, to get into the specific one, I don't know if the member's question was referring to uh, non-communicative versus strictly nonverbal. Uh, because, uh, again, there are services that are available uh, to our, our hospital uh, clinical staff to help with translations in various languages. My understanding is that does include sign language services. Uh, if it's further than that, uh, happy to, to look into for the member. The Honourable Member for Paul Arbor Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I know the family will be happy to have uh, your help with this. Mr. Speaker, this story should come as a shock to everyone, but it is a sad reality that things get missed. I don't want to make this an issue of the abilities of the medical staff. It is an issue of the trust that Nova Scotians want to have that the staffing levels in the emergency departments are sufficient and that the staff are trained to treat both verbal and nonverbal clients. This particular patient had the uh, tremendous support of all of her family members who were there to advocate on her behalf. But when you have an emergency room that is backed up, doctors feel the pressure because there is always one more patient who needs your attention. My question to the minister is, does he know how frequently cases of misdiagnosis are made in Nova Scotia? Are parents and families notified? And what is his department doing to make sure that these misdiagnoses doesn't happen in the future? Thank the you. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Again, uh, thank the member for raising uh, this uh, question. Uh, indeed, uh, one of the important steps uh, with respect to quality improvement and improving uh, the care and the outcomes is, of course, uh, recognizing, identifying, recognizing, and acknowledging when uh, mistakes uh, or um, you know, care doesn't meet the standard that one would expect. Uh, one of the things that gets done is, of course, uh, uh, systems are reviewed. I believe it's on a quarterly basis. Serious incidents uh, do get uh, posted publicly, so they are reviewed. Uh, when serious incidents occur, there are also quality reviews that take place. Uh, family members uh, or, or certainly the, the patient would be uh, advised, again, with privacy rules, whom that person would be, whether it's the, the patient themselves or an alternative uh, caregiver provider that would have that uh, authority. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, uh, again, reviews are conducted, uh, data is even posted publicly through the serious incidents reports, uh, and uh, quality reviews are conducted and information is shared with the patients. The Honourable Member for Northside, Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is the Minister of Health. 
Mr. Speaker, my constituency office has received countless calls from concerned Cape Bretoners about access to a family doctor. A new building is not going to address the need for a family doctor, Mr. Speaker, and the field of dreams th theory that build it and they will come is not going to work according to the doctors I've spoken to. My constituents deserve better than a walk-in clinic where they can be seen by a random doctor for about five minutes. So, Mr. Speaker, in the spirit of working together, my question to the Minister is, would he come to Cape Breton on October the 14th? Join me for lunch, and I promise, Mr. Speaker, that afterwards, we'll throw him a big party in New Waterford. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I appreciate uh, the question from the member uh, opposite. Uh, as the member would know, uh, we uh, are working diligently with our partners and the health authorities to improve recruitment of all uh, frontline health care professionals. Mr. Speaker, as a government, we're investing to address uh, concerns around compensation, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so those, uh, those are steps that we're taking uh, to support the members. Order, uh, please. The time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. We'll